Okay, today we're going to be looking at how to get around the dreaded systematic review. And I say that because in the sciences, because of the amount of literature there is, it often is seen as a dreaded process. I'm going to be speaking specifically from the sciences. I'm in the Department of Human Kinetics and Ergonomics at Rhodes University. And my research is in sports science and physical activity and health. Now, systematic review aims to provide an extensive overview of current literature relevant to a research question, like an empirical study would be. It differs from other types of reviews in that it provides a very precise step-by-step -step process to explain how the literature was obtained. A true systematic review covers the entire scope of the research field and provides the author with all the relevant information needed to make a case within the field. A good systematic review will give a detailed argument for the use of a specific method derived from evidence of past relevant epidemiological studies, and it provides the author with a range of methods and outcomes, which the author will then be able to assess and make decisions as to what method would be appropriate for their particular research. It has the same structure as an empirical study, an abstract, an introduction, method, results, discussion, and sometimes end notes. So what do you need before you start a systematic review? You need a basic understanding of your topic. You need a fast or good internet connection with access to databases, an organized library to store your journal articles, for example, Mendeley, a lot of patience, and some helpful hints that I'll give you during this presentation. There's seven steps to follow. You need to come up with a research question. Then you need to design your research protocol to answer that question. You need to do your literature search, which is your data collection. You then need to do your data extraction. And then you need to rate the quality of those journal articles. And then you need to analyze and write up the results and interpret the results in a discussion. Start your review process by attaining a basic understanding of your topic and the way in which you obtain this is read, read and read some more. And this should help you identify who the leading researchers are within your field as well as help you identify keywords and phrases that you can need that you will need to begin your search strategy. From here you develop a research question which should serve as the starting block of your systematic review as it would do for an empirical study. Here's an example of a research question that my group used in a systematic review is does constraints led training assist with the development of technical skill in interceptive sport and I'll give you some examples from our systematic review as we go along. The research protocols are how you design your method. There are a number of decisions that you need to make and which will influence the result of your findings. So up front you need to decide on the following in consultation with your supervisor and preferably a team of you. What should happen with a systematic review is that the two of you do the data extraction and quality reporting and then compare notes and hopefully you're getting similar findings. So decide on the following for your search strategy, the keywords and phrases, the databases you're going to search, what your inclusion and exclusion criteria are and what assessment tools you're going to use to assess the quality of the journal article selected. Um, and you're going to have to support with evidence the decisions you have made and take note of all of this beforehand um, and make sure that you follow it stringently, eliminating the risk of bias of altering it later. Now the keywords and phrases, you should be able to get some idea from relevant journal articles within your field of interest and see what keywords and phrases they used. Use as many synonyms and variations of those keywords as possible and you need to ensure that you cover all your bases and that's why working in a team with other people is so important. Now this will go in your systematic review and this comes from the study that I used as an example earlier. Here's a list of key words and phrases. So I'll just show you here we have skill. Another way of saying skill is technical skill, motor skill, coordination. Likewise for improvement, for interceptive sport, constraints led and intervention. What do you do with your keywords and phrases? You search for a list of databases, search engines, and you identify those that would play host to journals within your field, and you enter the variation of keywords into each search engine exactly the same way. So, and also ensure you search all categories, so the title, the abstract, the main body text, the authors, etc. 
Then what to retrieve, so data extraction. After you've entered the keywords and phrases, keep track of the numbers of hits that you're getting. You'll need to record the amount of journals that come up with each combination of keywords, and you will need to record the amount of journals you downloaded from each of the databases. Don't let this deter you because often you eliminate journals just based on the title. You read that and you can see it's not relevant to your study. So it sounds like more work than it is. Here's an example of a results of keyword combinations for a search in Google Scholar, which you can put in your systematic review. So here is the journals, the keyword combination one, combination two, etc the number of journals and the number downloaded. So the reader knows exactly what you did and how you did it. And then you screen the downloaded articles to a preset, a importantly preset inclusion exclusion criteria determined by you, your supervisor and the other members of the research team. These criteria reflect the specificity of your research question and the quality of the work you're prepared to accept. So, for example, if you're interested in constraints-led training in cricket, then these would form part of your inclusion criteria. You may want to eliminate what we call grey literature. So, things that are, have not been peer-reviewed, for example, theses or lay publications. However, the, those types of things often contain useful information. So, if you can get access to the grey literature, I would say it's a huge plus, but then you would need to expand your research team because it's a lot of work. Um, the criteria are very important and should be considered with the help of your supervisor and the rest of the research team. Then you start the screening process and this takes a three-step approach. Step one, you screen according to title and like I said before, you're going to eliminate a lot that won't be relevant to your particular research question. Then you screen for the abstract and what you might find is you're interested in the sport of cricket and in the abstract you find out they're actually looking at the insect cricket so then you know that you can exclude that particular article. Then the ones that you think are relevant in step three, you need to read them in full text to see if they are relevant. And those articles which satisfy the inclusion exclusion criteria will then be reviewed at that point. So data extraction, what do you extract? Once you have reached the last stage of your screening process, stage three, it's time to extract your data. And this requires a thorough read of each journal article from start to finish and preferably a number of reads. So you want to make sure that you have extracted everything and haven't missed anything. What do you extract? The reference, the objectives, the study design, the population, the intervention they use, the control group, the outcome, so the results, and any comments about the study. And a good is to have an Excel spreadsheet, which you can then put in a table in the systematic review, and which could look something like this. So you've got the study, the sport, the intervention that was used, the population, the participation, training session and whether there was a beneficial effect or not or whether it was not applicable. Then you look at the quality of the journal articles. Now there are a number of tools to assess the quality of the studies you are reviewing. Depending on what quality you are assessing, you need to use different tools. You can either assess the methodological quality of a paper or the reporting quality of a paper or both. So you might want to see how tight the method is and if what they're testing is really what they are testing because if it's not then the findings are questionable or the reporting quality so that is do, do they provide all the information necessary for you to replicate the study these are separate assessments so take note of which tool measures which assessment and I've given some ideas of where you can go and have a look but as I say it's dependent on your field and there are a lot out there the method the logical quality refers to the appropriateness of the methods which determines the reliability of the findings and this is referred to as your internal validity. The evaluation tool used to appraise the method calculates a risk of bias score. So what was their risk of bias in their particular method which would then impact the findings that the study came up with. Um, for example, a study may not make use of important aspects of epidemiological research, such as randomized control trials, or a protocol which may be needed to blind participants and or researchers, and this would then increase the bias of the method. 
Then you look at the reporting quality, which is a separate appraisal. It refers to the completeness with which the study is presented and whether major items for the proper appraisal of the internal and external validity of the findings are clearly reported. And this makes use of a quality guideline tool, which allows you to assess the level of detail in the reporting of the study. For example, does the study report how the study size was derived, the sample size, or does the study report what statistical analyses were used? All important questions for replication of the study. Now, making sense of the quality assessments in the sciences, a typical one for methodological quality is the Cochrane collaboration, and there's weaknesses and strengths associated with that. In the sciences, reporting quality is often used with the strobe checklist and the advantages and disadvantages of that checklist as well. But again, you need to find out what tools are best for your particular study. And here's some areas where you can maybe read up more about assessments relevant to your research. Then your results section, as with any other scientific paper, the results section is comprised of tables and figures which graphically display what you have found. And this includes the screening process. And I've given you an example from our paper, which is over here. The interpretation of results, this is the discussion section, same as empirical research. There are two major aspects to interpret in a systematic review, the content, of the journal articles as well as the quality. So a lot of what I've been talking about has been emphasizing the quality and the search strategies. But remember what the journal articles actually found, if they are of a high quality, is just as important. So interpreting the content of the journal articles will allow the author to assess the general structure of methods within the specific field. The quality of the journal articles will allow the author to critique journals and rank according to greater quality. This will also give insights into the strengths and weaknesses of particular studies and maybe help you to design a study that has a lot more strengths in it. Interpreting the quality assessments is a fundamental process and will give an indication as to which methods and techniques should be considered more important and which should be scrutinized for lower quality work. Here's an example of the results of a methodological quality assessment, which would go into the results section of your systematic review with the paper and then with all the criteria and then their total quality assessment. So here, a good quality method, a score of 10, that means that you can take the findings of that and know that they're really reliable. Whereas a score of 5, which is the lowest in this case, is you need to inter interpret the findings with some caution. This, the, here's an example of results of the reporting quality of the assessments and here are the studies and you can see 100% would be the best reporting quality and most of the studies actually have very low reporting quality. Interpretation of the results, which is the discussion part, um, it should be used in conjunction with the methodological quality score. Sorry, the, that should be used in conjunction with the reporting quality score to get an overall understanding of the quality of the article. The aim of the discussion is to answer the original research question that was set out by you. And this is done with the support of the evidence extracted from the included journal articles. You need to be able to argue a case for a specific method through facts found during the data extraction phase. The reader can follow a logical flow of the argument with support from e evidence as to the cost benefit of specific aspects of a method. The systematic review is therefore an objective structured process which provides you with almost all the necessary literature to make academic decisions on what method to consider. The discussion of the systematic review should answer the initial research question while providing insights into the advantages and disadvantages of specific methods. The systematic review should also provide the author with an indication of do's and don'ts with the help of quality assessments. Thank you very much.